Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a little bit bored of this format. Is that just me? I don't think so. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. I actually have my trusty traveler's notebook with me today that I'm going to share with you guys instead of talking about what I've read since yesterday. <laughs> with you guys while I just sit here and talk to the camera. I'm actually going to start something new. I've never done this before, but I'd like to start a book journal. I've journaled a lot in my life. I've bullet journaled a lot in my life. I've done a lot of planning. I watch a lot of videos about stationery and journaling and stickers, and it's content that I really enjoy. I'm actually art also an artist. I do a lot of oil painting. In fact, my easel is just on the other side of this camera here. I'll show you. So that's my little art corner and some of my artwork around around my office. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna set up a new journal and I'm gonna tell you about what I read yesterday. Let's go. Okay, hi. So we are now at my dining room table and I think the sound is gonna be a little bit different in this room just because there are a lot of hard surfaces. So crossing our fingers that that will work in editing. I don't know, but the lighting is actually kind of nice from this window that's over here. Also, my fridge is right here because it's right by the kitchen. Anyway, for some reason, I'm really anxious about the noise in this video. Um, so I have my traveler's journal and some of my journaling supplies. I actually really like stamps because I like the way that you can kind of use them endlessly and obviously alphabet stamps and number stamps are really, really useful. This is actually the sum total of my washi collection. Unlike many people who enjoy journaling, I don't have an insane collection of journaling supplies and I kind of like to use my stuff up before I treat myself with some, some new stickers or new supplies because I like, I, it actually makes me anxious sometimes when I see how huge someone's collection is. And then I have glue stick. This is actually my favorite journaling supplies. I see a lot of people using different types of adhe adhesives, but glue stick works great for me and it's not too messy. The tiny pair of scissors is always useful as well. So um, inside I have the craft folder that you see in a lot of bullet journaling or jur travel notebooks. Um, and these are actually post-its that I've purchased and they have a really cute design on them. So I use these a lot. Um, these are some of my favorite quotes from the artist way that I like to keep to remind me to be creative. And then I got these stickers that are like different types of seals and um, like documents and things like that, sort of vintagey. And I got this pack of ephemera that just has on craft paper some quotes with like some ink blot stains on them. So these are fun to, to include on my pages as well. Here are some larger stickers and um, ephemera in, from that same design. And then here I purchased this like mini print pack of all uh, these different Pablo Picasso paintings and I just love it. So. And then over here are um, some extra pieces of paper, some scrap paper. Actually, pause, I'll be right back. There's another thing that is very, very important to use in a book journal, it's book pages. So um, if you follow me on any of my like book-related social media, you may recall that sometime last year, I read about three quarters of this book before I decided that it just wasn't for me. Um, I actually really like Ayn Rand's writing style, but I just find her argumentation annoying because not that I wouldn't consider her socio-political economic views. I would, I would like to consider them. I would like to take them face on and see if I agree or disagree and why. But I find that the way that she writes her narratives is she actually just does a lot of straw man <laughs> arguments and she makes the opposing position they're stupid and weak instead of actually like giving me a good understanding of why she disagrees with the op opposing side. It's like an ad hominem in by through fiction or straw man through fiction or something. So anyway, so I've been using this one, they're a really nice size of page to fit in here. And two, it's like, I, I've already determined that I'm not going to finish this book or keep this book in my shelves. And there's so many pages. And this was a book that I got at a secondhand store, so I didn't pay a lot for it. 
And I like the color of the pages and the size of the print and I don't know. I just like it from an artistic perspective. I even like its chunkiness. Do you ever feel that way about books? Like the closer a book is to a cube, the more I like it. Anyway, I'm rambling. So um, this is my personal journal, which you guys won't be allowed to see. Uh, and then this is a, a notebook that I have. I've tried to make a bullet journal out of it, but I kind of got too busy. I feel like there is sort of like a range in which a bullet journal is really useful, but if you're either not doing enough or you're doing too much, then the bullet journal itself becomes a problem. And then I tried to turn it into a commonplace book, but I don't write down quotes of things very often. And a lot of times I find quotes kind of, I don't know, insouciant and distasteful. So it's just, I should have known it's not my thing. So we're actually gonna replace this with my new blank insert. I've got to decorate it, obviously. And this is gonna be my new book journal. This one is just a, a plain lined insert. And then in my third slot here, I have actually a craft notebook that is a sketchbook. Um, and I've been really enjoying working on these toned pages. I, I don't, uh, never had a toned sketchbook before. So it has been really fun. I've been doing mostly charcoal drawings. Yeah. So that's what I've got. Let's decorate this thing and I'll tell you a little bit about what I read last night. So last night I actually started reading a Charles Dickens novel. It's been a long time. It's been a long time since I've read a Charles Dickens novel. I um, really, really like him. It's not because I don't like him. I'm very haphazard in this process, but it's just, Oh, that's not true. I read Pickwick Papers earlier this year. Was it this year? With quarantine, it's hard to tell. I think I finished it this year. And that is definitely not his best work. And I think he shows that he's developing as a writer. You can see the writer that he's going to become, but he had to kind of like find his sea legs in that book, I guess is how I would describe it. So I am excited to read this book, which is The Old Curiosity Shop. I have never read The Old Curiosity Shop before. So I have read Hard Times, I've read Great Expectations, I've read Oliver Twist, and obviously Pickwick Papers. So I think that's it on all of the Dickens that I've read. So yeah, I'm really, really excited. I really, really love Charles Dickens' humor. I really, really love his characterization. I think he's kind of a master of characterization. I think there are just so few people who write descriptions descriptions of persons so well as he does. The other thing that I find really interesting about the old curiosity shop is like pretty much every Charles Dickens book I've gone into, I have had an idea of what the novel is about. So like if I were to sit down and read David Copperfield, I would have a sense of what David Copperfield's about because I've watched like miniseries or TV adaptations of it. The same thing is true for like, for, you know, lots of other books that are more, maybe more famous. I feel like I've always known the name of the old curiosity shop, but I never really knew what it was about. But yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to kind of go into this fresh. There's not a lot of books that I go to into like completely fresh. When we first start out, like the first three chapters or so are actually written in a first person narrative from the perspective of what we gather as an old gentleman. And he enjoys going on walks in the middle of the night. And we see that part of the reason why he likes going on nighttime walks is it allows him, you know, sort of like peace and quiet in which to reflect. I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs walking around in the back background. We have hard floor surfaces so you can hear the na their nails on the floor. Anyway, so this first person narrator enjoys uh, taking evening walks and he enjoys it as a process by which to reflect on his day, reflect on people. And part of what he enjoys about nighttime walks is they give more room for his expansive imagination. Another thing that I really, really love about Dickens is the way that he can create, you know, these almost secret treasures, these little secret corners of London in the middle of the dingy city, in the poorest part of the city, you or just obscure parts of the city, you can find these wonderful, wonderful little uh, um, corners of the world where your imagination gets take to, taken along right where he wants 
you know, he wants to take you as the author. And it's just so wonderful. So you get introduced, obviously, to the old curiosity shop. And it's just this sort of whimsical, wondrous place. And it really reminds me of um, Wemmick's home in Great Expectations. So Wemmick, if you don't recall, is the um, assistant to the lawyer, Mr. Jaggers. And uh, you get to see his home as just this magical kind of quaint place, this sort of secluded and protected place where he takes care of his father. And it, you just, they have a really, really sweet relationship. And it's just so, so wonderful the way that Dickens is able to create a sense of place and a sense of, it, it creates hope is what it creates. It creates a sense of hope because even in the midst of this dark and dingy city, you have these bright and magical places. And maybe that's the power again of the author's imagination. I don't know, but it gives you hope as, as a reader, or as a listener, you know? So in the course of the evening, our main character, our main narrator, a little girl approaches him in the middle of the night and asks for help, for directions. And she's so little and she's so sweet that our first person narrator, we don't really know who this man is, decides to walk her to her, where she's trying to get to, which is apparently quite a distance. He says, oh my goodness, I can't believe that you're so far away from home at this time of night. And the premise is set forth as the first person narrator sort of arrives and discovers what her home is like, which is this old curiosity shop. She's clearly being taken care of by her grandfather, who's quite elderly. And his grandfather sort of sets out this premise that um, she's going to, you know, be wealthy one day, that she's going to be a lady one day. And I really like it when a book sort of it has its conclusion already drawn for you. You don't wonder, you know, what is the outcome going to be? Those books are fun too. I suppose that's sort of like a key hallmark of a plot-driven novel. Not that you can't have a plot-driven novel in, in other, I guess, uh, structures. But what I like about this type of structure is that it's not so much about you know, where are the characters going to end up or who's going to end up with whom, but it's about how do they overcome the obstacles that are that they're going to face throughout the course of the rest of this novel, which is quite long, so we may be talking about it for quite some time. The other part of the old curiosity shop that we discovered that's quite interesting and intriguing both to the first person narrator and to ourselves is that we come to understand that this little girl actually stays the night in this shop by herself. There's a little bed for her, it's like a little fairy bed, and at the end of the evening grandpa leaves. She stays there by herself and of course this sort of brings again alarms to the mind and heart of our narrator, the person who's sort of introducing us to this unusual situation and he's quite worried about her partially because she's so darn cute so that is sort of like the premise and the mystery of this novel we understand that she has an older brother who she's not staying with but who seems to be quite motivated by money the older brother thinks that the old man and we have reason to think as well that her grandfather is quite wealthy and he's leaving her this big inheritance and it seems like this brother is trying to get in on it he's trying to look and sound sincere like he's really interested in having a relationship with his sister but we quickly see by the way that he interacts with her that he's that's not what he's actually there for and he really is just trying to get money which of course the grandfather does not appreciate I, I just have to say, at least read the opening three chapters because the characterization of the friend of the brother is just fantastic. I, I, just, I laughed out loud. I feel like there's not a lot of like comedy writing. Uh, a lot of it is serious. And I don't get me wrong, I like a good tragedy. As previously mentioned, Anna Karenina has quickly shot to the top of some of my favorite books of all time. And obviously, I really enjoy Jane Austen and she is absolutely hilarious. But other than like Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, Mark Twain, you know, there's not a lot of really comedic authors that we consider part of the canon, which is a shame. I do so love to laugh. So then after that premise is set forth, the narration switch switches to a third person narration and we follow a couple of characters that came into the curiosity shop and we kind of let, it's almost like the novel lets us follow them out back into their norm, the rest of their lives. And that is Mr. and Miss, Mrs. Quilp. And it actually, 
The funny thing is, is that I don't mind the narration switch. The, the first person narrator sort of says like, and now I'm going to um, leave you to you know, uh, uh, the rest of the people who can tell you more about this story. If a modern publisher were to get hold of this, they would say like, redo this or do it all in first person or make this a prologue or I don't know. I think I feel like modern publication probably wouldn't accept the format as it is. And the reason why I'm thinking about that sort of thing more is actually I have a friend who is a writer herself and helps with like book editing, copy editing. Uh, she has a lot of experience with publication and that sort of thing. And we talk about books quite a bit because she's quite a voracious reader. I always find her perspective interesting because I'm coming from more of like an English major literary analysis perspective and she's coming from like more of obviously the marketing publishing can <laughs> type of side where she analyzes the book and says like, oh, this classic book probably wouldn't, wouldn't have been published, <laughs> you know? And she, she has the different hallmarks that she's looking for than, as compared to me. So it's always, I find it very, very interesting and I really enjoy her perspective. She makes me think, so, think about books in an entirely different way. What else? What was I saying? Oh, so we make this switch and now we're following Mr. and Mrs. Quilp. Now in Mrs. Quilp's house, we see that she has friends over sort of, you know, in the spur of the moment for tea. Some of the ladies from the neighborhood plus her mother lives with her. And we also see from the first introduction, the way that Mr. Quilp, when he was in the shop, talked about his wife is we have the indication that he probably is, a, is you know, uh, maybe not physically abusive, probably physically abusive to her, but basically he has control over his wife through intimidation at the very least. And so we don't like Mr. Quilp very well. And we see that all of the ladies in the neighborhood have gathered together and they're sort of talking and making sort of proto-feminist arguments, right? This discussion of like what you should or should not allow your man to do to you. And Mrs. Quilp happens to be very meek, very mild, and very intimidated by her husband. Now, the way in which we're engaging in this conversation is a little bit tongue in cheek. It's a little bit ironic and it's hard to tell, you know, whether Charles Dickens is in favor of these women sort of getting together and gossiping and talking about how they wouldn't let their husbands treat them a certain way and that Mrs. Quilp shouldn't let her husband treat her the way that he does and meanwhile sort of emphasizing that they are, Mrs. Quilp has, you know, a, a pretty nice house and they're enjoying tea at his table and that sort of thing. So I think there's a little bit of a, a way in which he is dismissing the female perspective through this conversation. And I don't know what Charles Dickens' personal experience, opinions were. I just think that the narration at least is not giving this in a particularly positive light. Then as soon as Mr. Quilp gets home, he sort of disperses the ladies through his normal intimidation tactics and uh, that's about as far as I got. And we see that Mrs. Quilp's mother, her mother-in-law, Mrs. Jenison, Jen Jenison, I don't remember, who was talking a big talk, doesn't really have the courage to stand up to him. Oh, one more concept that I think comes out in Dickens a lot and came out in the conversation between the grandpa and then the older brother of Nellie, who's our, the little girl, our main character that we're gonna follow, I think, is th I think Dickens has a real problem with greed. He ha it comes up a lot in his stories, and so I think greed is gonna be a big thing in this book. Okay, so now I'm actually gonna write out my stuff. The pen that I have here is a really simple fountain pen. This is one from a Chinese maker called Wing Sun, and this is the 698. You can get this on Amazon, it's about 20 bucks. This isn't the best nib in the world, but it's 20 bucks and I actually really like this pen. So there's, there you go. I'll actually try and link it down below if I can find the listing on Amazon. And if you want to pick up one, you can.